Hello, welcome to La Jolla Christian Fellowship. We are the youth band. Thank you for coming today. It's a blessing we get to be together despite everything going on. Um, we're going to lead you in some worship. with us, um, however you feel that.
so deep it washes over me he washes over me I want to sing that again and let the youth band lead us just as a pastor I'm just so proud to have this group of young people at our church that are just passionate about Jesus passionate about leading you working so hard to be here this weekend to do everything that they could to pull this off to make sure that we can bring Jesus Christ to you and the spirit to you and let's just say we need the love of God right this what the world needs is a massive hug from the love of God, and so your love is so deep. And so Chris, would you lead them, start them up with that again, and let's lead that chorus through one more time. So deep is washing over me. Your face is all I see. You are my everything. Jesus Christ, you are my one. Lord, hear my only cry to know you all my life. Your love so deep is washing over me. Your face is all I see. 
lift him up right now, no matter where you are. We just lift him up now in this place. God, we just bless you tonight, Lord God. Today. God, would you be with us in this place? God, we just thank you, Jesus, for this time to gather, no matter where we are, here live, tonight at the park, anywhere in the world that people see this. And God, we pray for the love of God to fall over us, Jesus, our own heart, just right now, just to breathe in. Release all the fear, anxiety, worry, whatever it would be. And surrender our hearts, more territory. Surrendering the territory of our hearts to God. So God, we bless you and we thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, have a seat if you would. So good to have you all here uh, this Sunday. We have made some uh, incredible uh, dance moves in order to make all this happen. Uh, we, we get directives on Monday, and then within 24 hours, we turn it around. But we're just making it as much as possible. Whoa, we got a little something going on with there. Got it? Cool. So uh, we're excited. We have our first kind of outdoor service that we've kind of ever had. So we have an outdoor service. We have one tonight. We're going to continue to increase that and increase the availability for that so all people online can meet and be connected uh, as, uh, um, as much as we can. So with that, I have a couple announcements before we start the service today in regard to some things that I've been speaking about for a while. Uh, if you were on our mailing list, hard mailing list, you got a, a, a letter this week that talks about where we, were finan where we are financially as a church, uh, what's been going on, some of the great things that have happened during the first two quarters. Uh, it's been really incredible to watch the church come together and all the things that have happened. The letter is full of good news and uh, thanks to your faithful support. So we did promise that was going to come out. That has come out and there will be another one following it up with a little bit more detail, but that did come out. Another thing that I wanted to mention, and we pushed it back last week because we had the baptisms, which we were super excited to have those baptisms, was I wanted to talk about uh, the whole idea of what this church wants to do to talk about racial injustice or racial equity in the world. And so that was pushed back. And I want to share with you where, what we came up with uh, as a church. We spent the last seven weeks. We did not immediately issue a statement. We didn't immediately uh, you know, jump to some conclusions. We really wanted to go deep, seek the Lord, speak to people at the church, speak to people of all colors at the church, speak to other churches and leaders, and kind of find out where we want to land as a church. So I just want to tell you, there's four things that we've decided to do. We can add and expand this. We can contract it. But here's what we want to do, because we want to be a church for all peoples. And 2020 really has been a year of focus. It's really helped us understand who we are as a church. We've actually gotten much more clear vision. In September, I'll be sharing the vision of going forward as a church. Uh, but what we want to do in regard to this issue are four things. First of all, I personally am going to commit to a deeper education in this area. So the, I'm going to be applying to USD for the MA in um, Peace and Justice Studies. It's here in San Diego. It's a two-year program that I am personally, as your lead pastor, I think that it's important that the person who is leading the organization is really well-versed in things that matter to society. And this has always mattered, but it's obviously pressing at the moment. So as your pastor, I'm going to commit to educating myself more and going for that degree there. And I think a lot is going to happen in our church as we work with our missions department. Today is Mission Sunday as we talk about that. The second uh, element of this plan is to continue to partner with uh, multi-racial, multi-ethnic churches throughout San Diego. Now, we did that with the We Pray San Diego event. A lot of churches, inner city churches, churches um, from all uh, races and backgrounds met us there. I made some great relationships with pastors and lay people, and we're going to continue to do events with them and continue to have partnerships. Maybe we'll go uh, there for a service day. We'll invite their churches here for a service day, but we're going to be deepening those partnerships, and you're going to hear more and more about those partnerships. So that's stage two. First is my own personal education. Two is partnering with churches so we can understand each other and, and continue to work together. Um, the, the third component is we have a series of courses 
that are going to be starting in September. There is about nine to ten courses that we're offering to you as a church so that you will understand uh, what it means to grow in Christ. And these are everything from financial peace uh, to a discipleship essentials course, all types of things that will be available to you so you can grow in Christ. But we've worked on a curriculum of courses that we want to challenge you and encourage you all to take. And these will be, some of those have already been here, some we're creating. One of the ones we're creating is a four-week course on the theology of race, looking at the Bible. What does the Bible actually mean when it says all tribes and tongues will, be, will hear of the gospel, when it talks about all the nations of the earth being assembled in heaven? What does that mean? How do we understand race, and why did God allow us to look different? Why did he allow us to be different? And what is the beauty of that quilt um, supposed to look like, especially in regard to the church? So we'll be running this twice a year. Uh, that course in particular, we'll be running Financial Peace and all of our other courses, but you can jump into that. It'll be dialogical. It'll also be some teaching. We have um, some different videos that we've gotten from different pastors in the area that speak on this, pastors of color, and then we'll be doing that. So that's the third thing. And the fourth thing is I think art is really important. I think art and, uh, is something that really speaks to people. When you speak of revolutions, especially spiritual revolutions or even political revolutions of the kind, art seems to speak to people. And so I really want us to push forward with some, art, some projects, some art uh, here on campus. La Jolla is a, a city that really values art. And so we'll be working with local artists. I'm going to be working with a team and local artists to display art here at the church, have different things that we're going to do. But that's kind of a fourth component, just to kind of show some symbolism of what we're doing. So those are the four things. If you have any ideas that you want to add to that, or, or, or we can grow that, but that is where we're going to start. We're seven weeks away from putting a letter out about what we're going to do as a church, and I'm really excited about going forward. And I feel really positive about this. I feel like it's a great conversation. I'm looking forward to learn and continue to do things here at this church. So with that, I am going to pass the mic uh, over to Drea Gallegos, who worked incredibly hard with our media team to get everything set up this week so we could have outdoor services. Can we just give it up for them? Anybody, you guys that are here? And uh, yeah, Drea. Thanks, Pastor. Um, yeah, so as Adam mentioned, that mailer went out. It did go out this week, but if you don't have it yet, you don't have to email me. It's okay. It didn't go out till Friday, so you'll get it soon. Don't worry about that. Um, I want to also mention uh, that as Pastor already has said, we made some quick modifications. Luckily, we already had a really amazing safety plan in place, so we didn't have to do very, very much when the public order changed. But we did move our services outside. We're going to have more um, opportunity to do outside services. Thank you guys so much for coming anyways. I love seeing you guys' faces. It helps us so much when you're here in person. Thank you for being here. Um, but for those of you that are watching online, we still love you. We're still going to be connecting with you. Don't worry about that. Um, we're going to have both options for you. Uh, so yeah, excited about that. Um, we also uh, have our Bay Night tonight. God is sovereign, and that timing was perfect that it worked out with this announcement that we're, you know, doing more outdoor services. But we will be at Church at the Bay tonight, 5.30. We are hoping you'll come a little early because we want to start promptly at 5.30. We're going to live stream this event. Pastor Sean's going to do that for you. Uh, we have our worship, our youth band's actually going to be there, and uh, Pastor Adam with a message. We're hoping you guys will stay afterwards, bring your picnic essentials and hang out. Uh, Miss Kim and Thais have some little gifts for the kids after the service. If you guys want to stay and join us, it'll be a really cool fe way to fellowship in a safe way. So excited about that. Um, that's one Summer for Your Soul event. We have a lot more. We're still doing our um, worship Wednesdays with Chris Harrell. We're still doing most of our uh, other some of your souls, nothing got canceled. We need some modifications to the ones that needed it, and everything else is still running. So please check out our calendar page, uh, find out which event uh, you're interested in, and join us there. Uh, with all of the changes this season, though, I did want to mention, uh, too, I don't think you guys have had a chance to meet Sandra yet. She's joined our team. We've been so blessed, come on up, Sandra, to have a, new, a couple of new staff. Actually, you guys have already seen Joe Brandy around a lot more, and we're so happy he's coming back on board. But Sandra has been here working as an executive assistant, helping Pastor Adam and myself and Joe Brandy with just a myriad of really important projects. A lot of you guys already know her and have talked to her because um, she's doing such an amazing job. She's not really a spotlight person, so thank you so much for coming up so they can see your beautiful face. Um, but we wanted to introduce you to Sandra and just let you get to know her. And if you get a chance, yeah, thank her for coming on board. She's doing an incredible job. We're so blessed to have her, you guys. 
So um, yeah, and I think the last thing I have is youth camps, and this is my favorite announcement. It's really important. These guys are come. The camps are right around the corner. We have middle school, high school, and the senior trip, um, all right around the corner. Uh, Joe Brandy made this announcement last week. Two of you guys stepped up and gave. Thank you so much. I'm hoping um, that you know they don't have the opportunity to fundraise in the traditional way that we've always done. So I'm hoping you guys will. You know, find it in your hearts, pray on it. Go to our giving page. I've put it on where you tie. There's a pull-down bar. You can select youth camps there, and you can give to those kids. We do have several kids that are in need of scholarship this season, and they're really excited to go to this camp. So I'm hoping that you guys will be able to do that this week if you get a chance. And um, with that, I'm gonna. we have a little video. Just you, we're going to be featuring one of our campers who's really excited to be going. I'm going to show that video, and then Jade will be up for the missions moment. Thanks. Good morning, church. My name is Jade Connolly, and I am the missions liaison for our church. Um, today is Mission Sunday, and we have an update on two of our partners. The first is CAPS College Area Pregnancy Services. 2020 marks the 20th anniversary for CAPS. Um, they are now, they're over, across their three clinics, they're now seeing 1,000 patients per year. Um, and this summer, they will welcome their 10,000th patient through the clinic. So that's a really exciting way to celebrate their 20th anniversary. Every summer they do a fundraiser called Walk for Life. As with everything else in 2020, this one will be a little bit different, um, but it couldn't be any easier. <clears throat> so during the week of August 3rd through the 8th, pick any day, any time, and any route that you prefer and walk and pray for CAPS. It is still a, um, uh, an event, so please register in the LJCF weekly email you should have gotten on Thursday, there was a link to register for the walk. So just go find that email, click the link, and you can register. And it is still a fundraiser also. So CAPS is encouraging you still to try to raise some support from family and friends to support the ministry. Um, CAPS normally does a baby bottle drive. Many of you are familiar with that, and they were not able to do it this year due to COVID. So if you normally participate or contribute to that, perhaps consider giving to the Walk for Life instead. But we hope that, hope that many of you can participate in your own neighborhoods and join CAPS in prayer. And our second announcement is for Unity for Orphans, and I'm going to welcome Joe Brandy up to speak about that. Yeah, <laughs> What's up? Thank you, Jade. Wow. Hello. What's up? Um, Unity for Orphans exists to uh, transform the lives of vulnerable children so that they can experience all uh, that God has intended for them. And all those scratchy sounds are on purpose, just to let you know. Um, one way we do this is normally we do trips to Mexico to orphanages. We've done this for 10 years, twice a month for 10 years, to show the incarnation of Jesus, that consistent love, God hasn't forgotten about you. When we do that, we bring tons of food, tons of back-to-school stuff. But since the COVID happened, we can't do any trips. It's illegal to go into the orphanages. So... What we're doing, an email was sent out, and then outside we have child sponsorships for one of our orphanages back to school. If God leads you to want to give to any of those kids with school supplies and various things on that list, that would be amazing. Um, another thing we do is we have a school in Nicaragua. We have an English as a second language program school. This is just one of our beautiful little girls who literally could be a princess in another country. I can't look at her face or I'll start crying. Um, they live in shacks in Nicaragua. It's not an orphanage. And we have 45 kids that have been learning English as a second language literally for two and a half years by Nicaraguan teachers. And we also have a Christian counselor. So we are empowering them so that they get out of their caste system to the other caste system for the glory of God. And if you also want to help give into that program, talk to me. Um, it'd be awesome. And God's church will get glory as we point to Jesus for helping the vulnerable children. All right, so that's my Unity Orphans announcement. Um, now we're going to do uh, worship through giving. 
And there's been a lot of needs you guys have heard about. There's the, the kids camp for youth, not kids, but youth. Is that what I'm supposed to say? Right. Um, we have the CAPS thing. We have uni for orphans and just general stuff at the church. The church, like no other time to be light and salt in society so that Jesus' name becomes great. And uh, some of that happens through your giving. So there is an offering box somewhere back there. And then if you also want to give online, that'd be amazing. So let me pray. Father, Son, and Spirit, thank you for being so generous. You're our only hope. You literally are our only hope. Um, when we get humbled as a nation and as a world, it makes us cry out even more to you. So even though things are hard, thank you for this time. Help your church rise up in prayer and deeds of love uh, to transform this world into the glory of your son. We ask that you bless this offering in Jesus' name, amen.
Today's scripture comes from Mark, chapter 16, verses 12 through 20. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form to two of them while they were walking in the country. These returned and reported it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they were eating. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. He said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up snakes with their hands. And when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. After the Lord Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up into heaven, and he sat at the right hand of God. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. The word of the Lord. I want us to see what is a Christian. What is a follower of Jesus Christ? Oh. I would like to use as a subject from which to preach this morning, remaining awake through a great revolution. I'm not asking you tonight that you one night kneel down and make confession, and after that your life was no change, your lifestyle was no different, your appetites were no different, your prayer life was no different. Come on. It's been eight weeks, and hopefully you've been able to understand what Leonard Ravenhill is saying in the final part of that video. If not, uh, you can just keep replaying it, and then you will know. <laughs> your life is no different. Your prayer life is no different. Come on. I like that part. He is spurring us on, right, to, uh, to revival, and that's what we've been trying to do. Uh, over the last uh, six months, I think we've become more, it's become more and more clear to believers that we need to step our game up, at least in this country. Uh, and us as ourselves, that just playing church is not going to work, and we actually have to be the church and do the things that the church does. And as a staff, one of the things that's been really exciting is um, feeling like you're, you're, you become fully alive in crisis sometimes. You shrink back, you become fully alive. At least we found that. And so as a staff, we have just tried to dive in and take hold of all the opportunities presented us, but especially dive into prayer and actually caring for people. And I love every week we get together, we get a brand new directive of something that needs to change. We just get comfortable. Like I was just getting comfortable. I said last Sunday, it felt like normal, somewhat normative. It was so good. And then all of a sudden, it didn't feel so good. And I, got a, I was starting to get a text on Monday. Hey, the, the governor has made a decision to change things on Monday. What are we going to do? And this is like five minutes after the announcement. I just want people to know that whenever the governor speaks... The angel of the Lord does not appear before me in fire immediately and give me a complete directive, just FYI. So probably about Wednesday, I got to work it out. But uh, we, we, as a staff, what we have decided to do is we want to not only reach you, we want to reach the world. In this series that we've been speaking about, it's a series about uh, trying to turn the world upside down, coming off of the Jesus Revolution and the Sermon on the Mount series. How do we change the world? How do we make a difference in the world as we go forward? And so in this passage, we see Jesus spurring people to go, spurring people to take a dominion over not only their own hearts, the four corners that we speak about here on a regular basis, corner of your heart. If, if you haven't had the opportunity in the last six months to search your heart to see how much of it Jesus has taken uh, authority over and how much he has not, I want to challenge you to do so. The corner of your heart, we want to see the corner of our hearts completely where God invades our hearts, the corner of this church that we can, as a church, provide a replicable model of care for you, that when you look at what is happening here at this church and the way that we try to reach you and spiritually care for you, that you start getting the same passion in your own hearts for your neighbors, uh, for those that are around you. Uh, the third corner would be the corner in which you live, and the fourth corner, the four corners of the earth, what we're talking about today. In this passage, Jesus says, go. And in the final uh, episode of the uh, Sparking the Flames of Revival series, I want to call us to step into the command of Jesus. This is not a suggestion by Jesus. This is a command to take dominion over your heart, over the authority over your neighborhood, over disease, over sickness, 
over all of these things, over the demonic, over all of the, the, the structures and the power of evil in the world, and to do so by prayer. We've talked about prayer. We've talked about fasting. But to say, I want to take some ground. I want to take spiritual ground here on the earth. And Jesus is speaking to his, his disciples and saying, now I want you to go. The thing is, is that they went. The reason you're here today is because people very much like you, and I say it on a regular basis, you could have been in the Bible. The Bible is filled with people just like you. We want to make sure we're not setting up these archetypes that we never feel that we can be like. One of the passions we have as a church is presenting a model that you can actually replicate, the not showing pastors and worship leaders on stage, that you can never be like them because they're so perfect, uh, but something you can replicate. Jesus himself was perfect and was able to show something that was replicable. We want that to be replicable. Now, here's what's interesting in this passage. Go to verse 12, if you would. This is what really stuck out to me, because Jesus is telling them, he's commanding them to go, to take ground, and to take dominion after what would have seemed like a massive failure. Granted, Jesus is risen, and now they're, they're, they're putting together the pieces that he is risen, and that he has taken dominion, that he is God. But this is coming after a massive crisis. This is coming after a, a massive letdown where all of their hopes, all of their dreams, all of the things in which they cared for and, were, and cared about were taken away from them, and they had to rebuild at that point, and from that point to go. So look what it says in verse 12. Circle the word afterward. Afterward, Jesus appeared in a different form. Circle different form. There's two things that are really interesting there. One, afterward is obviously pointing that there was something that was happening beforehand. There was something that was happening, and after that happened, Jesus shows up. Jesus shows up in the afterward. This is such a key word, especially for people that have gone through trauma. Whether you're coming out of a drug addiction, whether you're coming out of a health crisis, whether you're coming off of some issue that has stripped away all the things that we were holding on to as dear. Jesus shows up in the afterward. And then the next thing that I think is really interesting about this passage, he shows up in a different form. Now he does this often after the cross. When he's raised from the dead, he shows up in a different form and you can be sure that the form in which he showed up to was the necessary form for that moment. He showed up differently. What I'll say here in a moment is too often we want the Jesus of before and we don't actually live in the afterwards as if he's taken victory in our lives. Look at this, I put this in the notes. Jesus is the master of bringing restoration in the afterwards. He is a master of it. Look at, look at the entire way in which he shows up to his disciple. And when we think about the afterwards of our life, maybe you're living in an afterwards situation right now. This is meant to be hope. Right now, as a society, we are living in the afterwards of some very traumatic events. A lot is going on, and I want to assure you that Jesus does his best work in the afterwards, but we need to meet him with faith. What you see is there was a group of disciples that were not willing to meet Jesus in the afterwards with faith. They lived in the doubt, and they lived in what they thought was reality before he showed up and said, no, things have changed. I am here in your afterwards. When Jesus appears in the afterward moments of life, he tends to offer himself in a different form and bring a new understanding and presence to the current reality. This is so powerful. That Jesus meets them, and when he meets them, he meets them with power. And not only does he meet them with power, he tells them that I will send you someone, the Holy Spirit, who is going to fully equip you, who will give you everything that you need in the moment, living in the afterwards. Do you have an afterwards in your life right now? I know that I'm picking up the pieces from the last six months, trying to find the pieces. Perhaps they weren't all lost, but definitely many of the pieces of my life, and more importantly, those that I'm surrounded by. I've seen people that have been really just affected in so many ways from what has gone on in our society. And realizing that Jesus, in the afterward moment, shows up in a different form, fully equipped to resource us in that need. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, are we willing to meet him in that place? It says he comes in a different form. This is what I found out personally. I so often, I want the Jesus of my past understanding. I don't want a new Jesus. It's not that he's new, okay? But Jesus is eternal. 
And when Jesus shows up in an afterward moment, he oftentimes comes and says, I want, to, I want to reveal to you a new side of myself. I want to reveal to you some new passions, some new understandings, some things that you might not even want. But I want to take you to a deeper place. Because Jesus is eternal, because God is eternal, he wants to continue to reveal himself to you in new ways. I, I found not long ago I had gone a long season of living in, with the same understanding of Jesus for a very long time, and I hadn't pushed myself forward. If you're part of my Holy Spirit SEAL team class, which anybody can join the next time we run it, and they are here amongst you right now, one of the things that I said is that I, I, I had a little bit of Holy Spirit PTSD. I had had some moments where I was pursuing the Spirit, and then I, Adam didn't get what Adam wanted. Life didn't go the way Adam thought it should go, and so I decided I was gonna put that aside, not the Holy Spirit, we were gonna continue to, to be bros, and I was going to pray in the Holy Spirit, understand how important the Holy Spirit was, but I, I wanted just to focus back on Jesus and the Father. And it was an incredible experience as God opened up the Father, and he met me in that place. But about 8, 12 weeks ago, the Lord said, hey, I want you to move on to the next level and the next place in your, in your existence, in your spirit. The thing is, I didn't want to move on. I personally didn't want to move on because I'd become very comfortable with the Jesus of my understanding. But when Jesus comes in an afterward moment, in a moment of crisis, or perhaps all the pieces have fallen on the ground for you, he often calls, will help you pick up the pieces, and then say, I want to equip you to take you to a new place. I want to invite you into something new. And it's going to be a completely different understanding than the understanding that you have had in the past of me. Are you willing to move on? One of the, the, the most exciting things in the last two to three months here at the church is being surrounded by a group of people that want to move forward. Surrounded by a group of people that want to reach out and receive the things that the Holy Spirit has, that he might resource us to, let us, to give us new understandings of what it means to be a Christian in a, in, a, in a multiracial world, in a global world. What does it mean to be a Christian with empathy? What does it mean to be a Christian in a world that perhaps doesn't receive the things that, that Christ tells you are truth? Jesus is showing up after crisis in a new way with a new calling and saying i want to show you a new understanding of me he shows up in a different form that does not diminish who christ has always been to you it doesn't diminish he wants to build upon that foundation but he wants us to grow in maturity and we see this happening here with these disciples it says in verse 14 uh, excuse me, that Jesus uh, appeared to them. If you go to verse 14, later Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. We'll talk about the importance of that when they're eating because there is a certain amount of communion that, that Jesus wants to have with us. And it is out of communion that revelation happens. Now communion, obviously the communion we take, but communion with Jesus, supping with Jesus, that out of that there is a calling out. When we commune with him, there is a fuel to go. If anything is accomplished in this sermon, I want it to be that you feel fueled to go out and change the world. It isn't a job for just pastors and missionaries like Joe to go to, to Mexico and different places. It is a call for us to go out and change the world through deep communion with Jesus. But in verse 14, it says, later Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. And then he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. There was a refusal. There was a refusal to perhaps even change their understanding. We know that Peter thought that Jesus was going to be a revolutionary and come and take a sword and take the kingdom. Judas probably thought the same thing and probably the reason why he betrayed. There was this Jesus of their understanding that was so important in the moment but we leave childish things behind sometimes because sometimes the Lord meets us in, the, in that way, but he wants to move us to maturity. These disciples were unwilling to let go of their past. They were unwilling to let go of the hurt. And for some reason, they were unwilling to see Jesus when he appeared and they doubted. They were holding on. One of the things that stops revival in your personal life, in my personal life, is being unwilling to see the things that have gone on in the past, to not be disappointed from the things that have happened in the past, to receive Jesus in the afterward and say, look, the pieces are all on the ground. 
I want to pick these pieces up with Jesus and reformulate them into a new puzzle. Because that's the thing with the puzzle of Jesus. All the pieces can be changed on a regular basis. He'll use these pieces, but he can change it and then change it again to give a new understanding of who he's called you to be. To call us out into that. And as a church, that's happening to us. God is reforming who we are as a little church on this corner of how we're going to change the world. And we're getting, I think, better at realizing we need to call those who come or are part of this community into deeper fellowship with Jesus and to deeper fellowship with this community as a whole so that we can send you out. Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. We often want Jesus of our past understanding. Go to verse 14. I want to talk about communion before I talk about their unwillingness to believe. It says in uh, verse 14, later Jesus appeared as they were eating. This is really important. Jesus' entire ministry was based around food. I don't know if you've ever seen that. And moments of great um, turnaround in people's lives. Think about when Peter goes to the shore after that huge denial, that personal failure in his life, right? And, and you're not disqualified because of a personal failure. We need to stop disqualifying ourselves because of a personal failure. Jesus does his best work in the afterwards. And Peter jumps in the water and goes to Jesus. He, when he finally recognizes that it's Jesus, or actually John recognizes that it's him, he swims. And what is Jesus doing on the beach? He's cooking food. He's having a meal. This is a symbol to represent deep communion. He wants to represent food in Jesus' ministry is all over. You know, obviously on the, with, the, with the feeding of the 5,000, Jesus is constantly surrounded. But what it's saying is, I want communion with you. What does communion actually look like? Is communion reading a little devotional in the morning and moving on? Or is there a new form of Jesus that in this moment of afterwards, because there's probably not a better moment in the last 30 years for us to reevaluate where we are in the territory of our hearts and the territory of our spiritual lives and say, Jesus, would you meet me in the afterwards and can we have communion together? I want a deeper communion. I want more of you. One of the things that held me back for years was because of the intimacy issues, because of a broken family that, that come, we, we learn these little traits to survive as a kid. We take these little traits into our lives, but eventually as we get older, those traits that were so valuable to protect us when we were a kid, to protect our hearts because we needed to as families fall apart, God wants to heal that. He wants to meet you in the afterward of that, and he wants to call you to deeper communion. And one of the hardest things for me is to want to step into that intimacy with God. Because intimacy for so many years has scared me. It's something I've been working on. I remember I was challenged one time to, I, 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 had, I had a season where I just was all about Jesus. This is like in, in my 20s. I was all about Jesus. Jesus was my bro. Jesus wore a cool white outfit. He had like cool beard, you know, before beards were cool again. You know, he was like, and I just wanted Jesus. I didn't really want the Father. And because of, you know, um, and I really didn't want the Spirit so much. I just wanted Jesus. That's all I I really wanted. And someone challenged me about six, seven years ago when I got to the church here, it was a mentor of mine. Hey, what do you think about going and just worshiping the Father? So I went on a three-day silent retreat to a friend's house. They live in Rancho Santa Fe. They said, you can use our, our house. We have an extra apartment. You can come stay in it. And I went and I said, I'm going to worship the Father. And so I began to worship the Father. You know what's crazy? I had a panic attack. I had an absolute, I mean, I hadn't had a panic attack for like 20 years. It's the only panic attack I've had um, since I had anxiety disorder long ago in my 20s. God's healed me of that. But when I began to worship the Father, and Jesus is like, I want to show you a new form. It's a form that's real to me, and it's not new to me, but I want you to know my Father. I'm desperate for you to know my Father. It terrified me. I actually got up out of the apartment and walked out. They have a little grove, and I walked out into a field just to get my wits about me. And in the last seven years, I've slowly continued to meet the Father and found such an incredible heart of the Father of God. It's affected my marriage, it's affected my, my, with my children, my intimacy, even personal relationships with my staff. Everything has changed. Why? Because there was an afterward moment where Jesus came, where the Spirit came, where the Trinity came, wherever you want to say it, the Word of God said, I want you to take the afterward, I want you to meet me in communion, and I want you to go deeper with me. In Luke 24, we see these gentlemen who met with Jesus, the same ones that are mentioned here in Mark 16. Now, this is a precursor to the story. These two guys, were disciples, were walking 
along a road, and Jesus shows up once again in a different form. These are the ones that go back to these men that, and, and disciples that are sitting uh, in the, perhaps are in the upper room here in the Mark story. But here's what's happened. Because remember, two people, they came back, they told them, we saw Jesus, and they said they didn't believe. They were in disbelief. And Jesus shows up and rebukes them. Here's the, the, pre, the precursor, here's the story in Luke 24, 30 through 32. When he was at the table, now they had just walked along the road, by the way. They had walked along the road, and, G, and they, Jesus was going to keep moving on. And I think that's important in this Luke passage. It's not here in the notes. But Jesus was going to walk past them. And they stopped, and they said, hey, do you want to come with us? And Jesus, he would have just kept going. It's really interesting. Why would he have kept going? But they said, hey, let's, let's come with us. Let's stop. We want to hear more. And so Jesus starts talking to them. And it says, when he was at the table with them, he took bread and gave thanks, and he broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven, and those who were with them assembled together, and they're saying, it is true, the Lord is risen. He's appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened uh, on the way and how Jesus uh, was recognized them by them when they broke the bread. When you have communion with Jesus, true communion is a, will, will send you. True communion with Jesus will open your eyes to the truth and it will send you out. We see this in the passage with these um, um, two disciples in Luke. That as soon as they ate, they got up and they went back to Jerusalem. It, it, it motivated them motivation to follow the spirit to take the world to bring revival starts with true communion we need personally to have communion because then that moves us to that next place and so they run back to jerusalem to tell the other disciples and what is the response of the other disciples it says he appeared to the 11 as they were eating uh, and he rebuked oh i'm sorry verse 13 they returned and reported it to the rest but they did not believe them either so they were having communion they were having a meal but it wasn't with jesus and when you have communion with everything in the world but Jesus, you're going to get a different result than if you take time to have communion with Jesus. It opens their eyes. And so Jesus here comes to them again, and he eats with them again while they were having their meal. And this time he speaks to them, and he rebukes them. In the notes I put this, in both instances, in Luke 24 and Mark 16, after the rebuke and after the repentance, the disciples were compelled into action after having spent time in communion with Jesus. So powerful. It's, it's interesting, as you preach, you always have to be aware that whenever you, you use terms like rebuke and um, Jesus has disciplined them or whatever it is, there's a large group of those that listen that that immediately triggers into guilt. I, I want to look at this idea of, of when Jesus rebukes us, when Jesus gives us a word of con conviction, when Jesus gives us a word of correction, it's never meant to take you into guilt. Conviction is meant to take you into change, to move forward, but never in guilt. Jesus died for all guilt. He died. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. If you have a problem with constantly feeling negative about yourself, bad, guilty, I never measured up, I've made a mistake, I had this issue, I've been divorced four times, you know, whatever the thing is, you have this thing that constantly beats you, go into Romans 8 and look about how Jesus says there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. That Jesus wants to meet you in the afterward of that, and he wants you to put the pieces back together into a beautiful picture of what your life is meant to be, and to let you step from that place from that place of doubt, from that place of worry, from that place of fear, out to change the world in a beautiful sonnet that tells the world of who Christ is. Because that is what happens with these disciples. These disciples fully doubted Jesus. He rebuked them, but then he moved on from the rebuke to a place where they were motivated beyond their doubt, beyond their worry, beyond their fear, beyond their failure, because Jesus allows mistakes. Because Jesus died to forgive us of our sins so that we might go out. Verse 14, he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Question one, do you have a stubborn heart anywhere? Are there issues in your heart 
where there's a stubbornness to believe, a stubbornness to go to that next level, a stubbornness in our heart to care for others, whatever it is. Is there a stubbornness to believe what God has? I had someone email me this week, and we had, they're coming to my Holy Spirit class, and I got a huge email from them. I got this question, this question, this question, this question, this question. And I, first of all, I couldn't respond to it all, and it would have you know, taken me a very long time. And I, but I felt like the Lord said, I don't want you to respond. I want you to respond that they, to pr- one of the gifts of the Spirit is faith, and to practice faith and to cease questioning for just a week. Just cease questioning for a week. And live in this idea of faith and see if God shows up. And then I got an email yesterday morning that said, hey, I did what you, you said, and God came and answered me in that moment. That God, I am no, you know, that I was realizing that questioning sometimes becomes part of that stubborn refusal. We just question so much, we question ourselves out of the truth, as opposed to sometimes just stepping forward in faith. So we see in verse 14 that he rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. If Jesus rebukes you, okay, if you feel a strong sense of conviction, and we usually need to slow down to have that happen, slow down and begin to search our hearts. I'm doing a thing uh, called the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius right now. Uh, It's four weeks long, and the first week you spend an hour each day asking God to purify you and find out where you have inordinate affections, things that you are inordinately affect, that are, are, are drawn to that actually take away from your spiritual life. And you spend an hour just going over your own personal sins, which seems terrifying, right? You get, like two minutes is enough of that, you know? But what I have found is such an incredible grace from God meeting me in that place. I'm only day three into it, so don't think I'm that spiritual, okay? So day three, we'll see if I even make it to day four. But sitting there, and Jesus, as he rebukes me, he rebukes me so gently. He's so kind. He's so wanting for me to let things go so that we can move on and begin to run together in an open field of joy. And I'm finding myself being drawn back to it every single day. Finding myself being drawn back to asking the Lord, what is this next thing? How can I give that up for you? How can I surrender that to you? That Jesus, when he rebukes, is actually grace meant to compel you into mercy and a Holy Spirit-led life force and mission. That if Jesus rebukes you, if you take the time, and not to sit in guilt and wallow, but to say, God, where have I offended you? Where am I drawn to this inordinate affection? Is it food? Is it media? Is it the news? Is it all these things? Are they unhelpful to me? How can I draw back into you? That if he does give you a word and say, I want less of that in your life, or I want more of this in your life, It is an act of grace. In Romans, it says that the entire law was meant that you might know what was wrong. If God didn't give us the law, then we would be continuing to sin without knowing we were sinning, continuing to go towards death. It is the law is an act of grace. And Jesus, the same way, wants to set us free. Do you have an inordinate affections, things that are holding us back? If so, just know when Jesus lets you know about it, it'll be an act of grace meant to compel you into mercy and Holy Spirit-led life force and mission. I just have to, for those of you that get triggered when, you know, I hear people, well, I went to this kind of church growing up, and they were really heavy-handed, and so I can't take any anymore. That, Satan wants you to get so affected by your past experiences that you can no longer receive the truth in the moment. Let me say that again. Satan wants you to be so affected by your past experiences that you can no longer accept truth in the moment. Well, I was, I went to a church and I, you know, they were really heavy handed and I have a lot of, you know, abuse or whatever. This thing happened and I can no longer, I'm just, I'm stuck. And Jesus wants to, if he's going to meet you, he wants to meet you so you can be motivated to move on. So I put this in the notes. Don't let the Holy Spirit conviction lead you to despair. Repent and move on into glory. Don't let conviction move you into despair. Some people never get to the part of doing a deep search of their own hearts, of where they have, you know, are failing in their, in their personal spiritual life because they're so terrified of the feelings that it conjures up within them based on their past experiences, not knowing that Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm showing you this because I want to show you this. 
I'm showing you this negative because I want you to move into glory. This is what I want your relationship with your children to like, look like. This is what I want your neighborhood to look like. This is what I want your joy to look like. This is what I want your emotions to look like. I'm going to show you something deeper, but we have to have the courage to go before God and say, God, if you need to rebuke me, please do. Because I know that when you rebuke me, it's because you love me. I believe it's in James, it says that, you know, it is God disciplines us because he's a father. And if you are not disciplined, then it, then it shows that you are unloved and you don't have a father. God wants to meet you that he might take you to a place of glory. And that was the same was true for these disciples. The result of them being rebuked by Jesus, go on down to uh, verse 13. This is after a rebuke, okay? This is what happens after a rebuke. Let me just assure you that when I was rebuked by my father as a child, my response was rarely this. It was, I remember one time I uh, was upset and I, they put me in my room for two days and they had got, my, <laughs> my dad, <laughs> sorry, my dad had a brand new TV, it was so cool, he could sit outside and watch the Padre games. And I got in trouble and they put me in my room for two, for I don't know how long it was, it was like 29 years, I think. And they had a TV and it was a brand new outside TV and I took the TV and I had this quartz rock my brother had and I just scratched the whole front of the TV up. I was just like, rrr, rrr. I, I was that kid, okay? I was like, ah, I was just angry. Ruined the TV, did not go well for me after that. I know all the moms are looking at me like, right? like, no, please God, don't let our child be like that. My mother is a saint. She's back there, she is a saint. I was so angry. How you rebuke me? I don't remember what I did. How dare you rebuke me? Get so prideful, whatever. Uh, look what happens when the Lord rebukes them. Look at the result of a rebuke. We, we would beg for rebukes from the Lord if this is the kind of result we get. After the Lord had, Jesus had spoken to them, he was taken up to heaven and he sat at the right hand of God. Then, circle then, because we have afterwards and then we had he showed up in a different form and then we have the rebuke and then we have then. I want to get to the then. I want to get to the then because here's what happens then. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. And the Lord worked with them and confirmed his words by the signs that accomplished it. It says, then the disciples went out and preached everywhere. The fire of God, spiritual arsonists, released into the world after a communion with Jesus where he showed them and he rebuked them and they weren't triggered into doubt, they weren't triggered into fear, they weren't triggered into paralyzation, they weren't triggered into being angry at, the war, at, the, at, at Jesus or at the church, no. They went, then they went out into the world and they changed it and the Holy Spirit came behind them and equipped them with signs and wonders and the entire world was changed because of that moment. A deep communion of Jesus. This is the sending message of revival. This is the message that Jesus wants us to know. He wants us to meet with him regularly, to say, Jesus, where have I, where have I failed you? Please speak to me. And then to be... Uh, like, a, like a chosen son or daughter of God to be embraced and sent out, bef out before. This gives you the opportunity to become the master of your afterwards. We often fail to capitalize on the setbacks of our lives. We often fail to, ca to capitalize on the setbacks in our lives. When we repent, it, it, the devil is meaning so many things right now to happen. And I love in Genesis 50 when you have Joseph speaking to his brothers who had sold him into slavery. He had been falsely accused by Potiphar. All these negative things happened, but all God did was keep raising him back up, keep raising him back up, keep raising him back up. And he says this, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. I love how God takes our brokenness, our worry, our fear, he turns it upside down and then releases us with passion into the world. Hey, whatever your story, as bad as it been, all the things that have happened, God wants to redeem your story. He wants to redeem your story for this, what Satan meant for evil, God meant for good. Whether that is a virus that has gone around the world, whether that is racial injustice that has happened, whatever it is that God is meaning to turn that around and he needs believers to be sent out into the world to meet him. That God might meet us in those moments. And so as we meet God, I wanna, I wanna say one thing, that 2 Corinthians 10, 7, 
as we meet the Lord and say, God, do business with me because I want to go out. I want to live in a then. I want to live in a different then. I'm willing to meet you in a different form. I'm willing to meet you afterward. This has happened, but I'm willing to meet you in the afterward. I'm willing to meet you in a different form. I'm willing to receive your rebuke. I'm willing to have communion with you. And I'm willing to go when you send me. Know this, that when God meets you and he does speak to you, that there is no guilt, there is no condemnation, but there might be godly sorrow. Godly sorrow is the proper, mature Christian response to our failures. 2 Corinthians 10, 7. Godly sorrow, it says, brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Let me say that one more time. Godly sorrow brings repentance. It means no guilt. You repent. Repent means you turn and go the other way, which leads to salvation. It'll lead to life and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. The message of repentance that we have, the message of reconciliation we have will lead to life. God wants to spark life. And so as we end this series on revival, I'm challenging you to meet the Lord in the afterward, to meet the Lord in the new form, to meet him in the then, and go out into the world and change, and take over not only the corner of your heart, but the four corners of the earth. So I send you now. Would you stand, please, as I bless you for that sending? I want to bless you, and as a church, we want to move forward as a church in doing these things that God has called us to, into the streets. I'm excited that Jesus is, we're meeting in the, in the parks. There's a lot of churches that are meeting in the streets right now and in the parks and on the beaches. I have a feeling the more they do that, the sooner they'll say, hey, go back to the church. It's all good. We don't want you out in the street. So we're going to be in the street. So you can come tonight at the West Mission Bay Park, look for it online. But if you need that sending and you need to be free from that regret and you need the repentance that leads to salvation, just if you feel comfortable, extend your hands, whether you're even online right now, I wanna bless you with a sending. Lord Jesus, first of all, out of this passage, I want to bless those, Lord God. God, that you will accompany those who believe that they will drive out demons, that they will speak in new tongues, that they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them like it says in this scripture. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. And God, that once you have been taken up, Lord, your disciples will go out and preach, that these here will go out and preach everywhere, and that the Lord will work and confirm by his word the signs that will accomplish it. Jesus, we, we want to know you as Father. We want to know you as our living God. We want to meet you, God. We, we ask that you meet us in the afterword of our regrets, in the afterword of this season of life. And God, change us through communion. We want to commune with you. I pray, God, that everyone here would have a longing for a deep communion with you, that we might be sent out to change the world. Would you bless this group of people? Would you bless this church? Would you bless this city? Would you bless this state? Would you bless this nation? And we go out and in this world, Jesus, and we send them now, and we send you now, After this series, we send you now to make a difference. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, well, hey, we love you. You can meet us back at the Bay tonight. Uh, Stay safe, socially distance, and go change the world. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.